Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Joanne Perry, for those of you who don't know me. I'm actually filling in for Leah today, Pastor Leah, she's out of town. So today we're talking about Romans chapter four, and instead of me standing here reading all of Leah's notes that she graciously gave to me, I thought that we would go ahead and watch a video which explains all about Romans chapter four. So I hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you after the video is started. Evangelists and Spanish and English speaking people. We have been going verse by verse through the epistles of Paul. In order of when they were written. And today we have come to chapter 4 of Romans. Last time we finished up chapter 3, we looked at how that chapter is so important to salvation as it shows us that salvation is by faith alone in the blood atonement. Verse 25, through faith in his blood, the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. And verse 28 showed us that the man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So it's not works that saves us. We are not saved by works. We are saved by faith. And as we get into chapter 4 here as well, we're going to see that same thing over and over and over. It's all faith. We're saved by faith and not by works. But before we get into this, last time I tried to show you the difference between the who and the what of salvation. And I'm trying my best to explain that. And uh, I was up last night. Before going to bed and just thinking all night long till I fell asleep, how would be the best way to explain this? And I've tried to explain it before. So I thought, huh, what if I drew it up on the whiteboard this way? So I'm going to draw it this way. That in Rome, when Paul is writing this book to Rome, who was in Rome? Well, there's several groups of people. In Rome, there was this crowd, Jews, who were under law. Law and rejected Jesus. So that's who these people were. And they were in Rome. They were very, very adamant. No, Jesus is not the Messiah. We must keep the law to be saved. So that was one group in Rome. And they were the group that Paul was always battling with. There was also another group. This would be the Jews who accepted Jesus as Messiah. That would be people that accepted this preaching here. Yet, this crowd was coming over to them and trying to tell them, no, you need to get back over here. I hope you see that. So when Paul is writing the book of Romans, he's writing to these people, telling them, those people are wrong. Jesus is the Messiah. You've got the message correct. Trust in who Jesus is. Trust your Messiah. But now you need this message. And this message is trust what Jesus did. Trust in the blood atonement. So I just want to make sure that you get it clear in your mind who Paul is writing to. There were also some Gentiles in Rome. That would be the ones that Paul is writing to here. And he's telling them, you have to be saved by the gospel. Which gospel is that? Well, that's the 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, which we'll actually see at the end of chapter 4. We'll see him presenting that gospel to them in chapter 4 and verse... Well, it's actually the last two verses there, 24 and 25. Here he starts to present the gospel. And what is this gospel all about? It's all about justification. And how we are justified today by faith alone and not by works. So if you're one of those so-called Christians that believes you're saved by works, you need to listen to this message. Because this message is so important. Because it shows that we are not, I repeat, not in any way, shape, or form saved by works or kept saved by works. But this crowd was the crowd that was saying, no, you got to do works, you got to do works, you got to do works. And that same battle that Paul fought back then is pretty much the same battle that we're fighting today. It's uncanny. It's, it's just it's amazing. We've got people that claim to be Christians, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, other denominations that are trying to tell people you have to keep the law to get saved or stay saved. And to teach that is to say that what Jesus did is completely meaningless and that Jesus can't save anyone. You can still save yourself by what you do. Remember, this is the gospel of 
you do something. And this gospel that Paul preaches is God did it all. God did it for you. So which do you want to do? Do you want to try to work your way to heaven and then realize when you wake up in hell that it's impossible? So let's say you live your whole life and you do the best you can. That one sin or those two sins or however many sins you did are all it took for you to have to go to hell. You can never live a sinless life. So who is our salvation? Jesus Christ. Sinless perfection. This will not save you. Salvation is only through what Jesus Christ did. Now with that stated, <clears throat> hopefully you can understand who he's writing to. Paul had not yet. He knew there were some folks with this gospel had gone to Rome and preached to them that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah. So those people are the second group. And then this group went to there and told them, no, 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 you have to get back under the law. So Paul is writing to them and telling them, you do not have to get back under the law. And he's writing to Gentiles as well, telling them, you don't go to this for salvation anymore. You go to this for salvation. So without further ado, let's continue here in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? Now remember, Paul's a Jew. And he says, our father... So it sounds like he's writing to these Jews. So these two different groups of Jews that were in Rome, he's writing to those that accepted the Messiah, but were still thinking they had to be under the law as well, and to those Pharisee hypocrites who totally rejected the Messiah and tried to, to get, get people under the law so they could put them under bondage. And he says, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? That's a good question. The question is, what did Abraham find? When you go back in the Old Testament, you read Abraham, and you find something very interesting. Abraham, the way God dealt with Abraham, was with faith and works. And that cannot be denied as we'll look through the scripture. Now, there's some people out there, some preachers, who do not understand this. And unless you understand dispensations, you can't get this. I've heard preachers say, I don't believe in dispensations. There's no such thing as different Bible dispensations. Well, then they're just showing their ignorance because dispensations just simply means there's different ways in which God dealt with people in different time periods in the Bible. I have a message on YouTube on dispensations. Sadly, part of the message is, is all just black screen. Something happened, and then my external hard drive burned up, so I was unable to, to repost it. So someday I'd like to go back and redo that teaching on dispensations. But dispensations is basically how God dispensed salvation to different people in different times. Under the law, you had to keep the law. And then you had to do a sacrifice when you sinned. Today, Jesus is our sacrifice. Two completely distinct different dispensations. Here it's by works. Here it's by faith alone. But with Abraham, it was a little bit of a mixture of faith and works. And so what we're going to see is that salvation is not the same through the entire Bible get a chance, go back to my uh, past sermons, look up the one called Dispensational Salvation, and let's see how different people were saved in different ways. And what you need to do is rightly divide the word of truth. What that means is you find out where are we today, and how do I get saved today according to the Bible? We are here in the church age, and we are saved by Paul's gospel. It says, what hath he found? Verse 2, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath went up to glory, but not before God. So if Abraham was justified by works, he could glory. What could he glory in? How great he was. I did all these wonderful, wonderful works. But it says, but not before God. When you stand before God and you start talking about how great you are, God just goes, Jesus, he's sinless perfection. You think you're great. You want to tell me how great you are? Look at how great my son is and what he's done for you. And you want to talk about how good you are? You're a sinner. Look at how great sinless perfection is. Do you measure up? As we read in chapter 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So you might try to glory in yourself and in your flesh, but guess what you'll find out? You've come up short because you'll never be as good as Jesus Christ. The only way to be as good as Jesus is if Jesus were to give you his righteousness. Well, guess what? That's what salvation is. When you get saved, God imputes to you the righteousness of Jesus. You know what that means? I'm saved. I trust Jesus my Savior. In God's eyes, I am just as sinless as Jesus Christ because Jesus imputed to me his righteousness by faith. Now that's 
something to glory about. But it's not about you that you're glorying. It's about Jesus that you glory in when you're saved. So Paul is here, and I'm going to read verse 2 and 3 together. For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So there's two different things about Abraham that we see. Abraham believed God. Okay? And that's faith. And when he believed God, he got imputed righteousness. So God imputed to him his righteousness by faith. That's number one. Number two, it says, he was justified um, by works. So he was justified by works. So I told you, and I told you correctly, that Abraham was saved by faith and works. He was justified by what he did, his work, but he received imputed righteousness by faith. Now, if you get a time and you have some, a few hours to, to uh, do a Bible study, go to the Bible church, look up my past sermons. I have one on what the Bible says that, about the doctrine of imputed righteousness. That's so important. And I have one on the doctrine of justification. And that will help you understand what imputed righteousness is and what justification is because they're both so important. But when it comes to this Old Testament guy, Abraham, God, way back then, said, I'm going to take this guy, Abraham, and I'm going to have him do some stuff that will be a type of me in the future. And I'm going to a different way of salvation in the future. Now, was Abraham saved like we were back then today? Well, I've heard many preachers say, yes, he is. Okay, well, are we justified by works? No. No, we don't get justification. What does justified mean when we split it up? It's just if I had never sinned. According to the Bible, today when we're saved, we receive the imputed righteousness of God, and we are justified at the very moment we believe. Go to Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 1. Being therefore, therefore being justified by faith. But yet this guy was justified by works, so that's different. Uh, five nine, I believe it is, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We are justified today through the blood of Jesus. Was Abraham justified by the blood of Jesus? How could he be when Jesus hadn't shed his blood yet? You get in a mess when you get ministers preaching that people are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament. I made a message about that on, on YouTube. You can look that up as well. We are not saved the same in the Old Testament as we are in the New Testament. It's always been different. God, who in sundry times, and in fact, let's go look there. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 clearly shows there is a thing called dispensations. God, who at sundry times, who at sundry means various, various times, and in diverse manners, what does diverse mean? It's different. Spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So we see God who at various times in different manners, who at sundry times in the diverse manners spoke to different people. So God dealt with people in different ways throughout the whole Bible. And that's what we got to get. So what we're going to do is we're going through this book of Romans in chapter 4. God starts out by giving us an example of a guy named Abraham. It's an example because Abraham and things that happened in his life in type point to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's also a comparison of and Paul's going to say, look how he was justified by faith and works. He says, now look at us today, how we're not justified by works. We're justified by faith alone. So what we're going to see here is a comparison between the two, a contrast. This was this, but now look, this is this. We're also going to see Abraham as a type of New Testament salvation in a way of how it was through faith. So chapter 2 there says, or verse 2. Romans 4, 2. If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. But was Abraham justified by works? And for what said the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So Abraham believed God, and God gave him his righteousness for belief, for faith. But the justification did not come until Abraham did something. We received 
received imputed righteousness the moment we believe, and we are justified the moment we believe. So we get it all through faith alone. He had to do something to get the justification part. But let's look at that. Go to James chapter 2. In James chapter 2, it, it tells us something. This is something here. <laughs> I've dealt with many pastors that, that are so shallow, they don't know how to write the Bible or the truth. Many different pastors that all they do is just preach what their denomination tells them rather than reading the scriptures and going through what it says. And this has been a point of contention with many ministers. Because most ministers are taught in their Bible schools, and wrongly so, the teaching that people are saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross, and people saved in the New Testament by looking backwards to the cross. You know, that sounds beautiful, doesn't it? It just sounds so pretty. Oh, they're looking forward to Jesus in the Old Testament, and that's how they got saved, and they're looking back to Jesus in the New Testament. That just sounds nice, but it's not Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Because here in the Old Testament, nobody knew anything about a cross. There was no cross until the Romans showed up. The cross actually comes from Egyptian stuff, but the Egyptians didn't sacrifice to a cross. What is the cross? The cross is a T, and the T comes from Tammuz. It's a pagan symbol. It's the letter of their pagan god. When they were doing these sacrifices, they were sacrificing to their pagan gods. So that's why Jesus became a curse upon the cross. He allowed himself to be nailed as an offering not only for our sins to God, but he let the people that worship the devil think, hey, he's an offering for us too. Isn't that something? So Jesus Christ died on the teeth, the Tammuz. How could these people back here be trusting in Jesus Christ as their Savior if, number one, Jesus hadn't come yet? If, number two, he hadn't shed his blood yet? And if, number three, they didn't even know what his name was? There's three times in the Old Testament where the angel of the Lord shows up, Jesus, in a pre-incarnate state. And they ask him his name, and he doesn't answer. One time he showed up to Manoah, the father of Samson. He said, what's your name? He said, didn't answer him. But one time he showed up to, to uh, I believe it was Jacob. He says, what is your name? And the angel of the Lord said, no, what's your name? Well, Jacob's name meant supplanter, deceiver. God was making him, you know, say who he really was, you know, because he had deceived his brother. And then there's a time uh, where in Solomon it says, what is his son's name if thou canst tell? Talking about God. Nobody in the Old Testament knew the name of Jesus Christ. So how could they be saved by looking forward to Jesus on the cross? Now, if you put them in Abraham's bosom when they died, sure, they were waiting for a promised seed to come and pick them out. And when Jesus died, he came and took them out and he took them up. But in the Old Testament, to be saved, if you were under the law, it was by doing what the law said. Before the law, God spoke with people in different ways and told people to do different things. For example, Noah. God told Noah to build a boat. Would he have been saved if he didn't do that? No, he'd be dead. We'd all be dead today. Nobody would be here. So, and here in James chapter 2, we read James 2, 20 through 24. And notice there are a lot of questions here. It says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and was puted unto him for righteousness, and was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. And Martin Luther, when he read this, he said, Boy, I hate this book of James. I want to throw it out, because it doesn't make sense. And he says, Because that's the exact opposite of what Paul says. We're saved by faith without the deeds of the law. We're saved by faith, and justified by faith, and not by works. And yet James is over here saying the exact opposite. He said, I don't know what to do that with that. And so Martin Luther said, I would like to light my stove with the book of James. I'd like to just burn it up because I can't understand it. Well, it's not that hard to understand. Different time period, different way in which God dealt with people. But notice what he says. Abraham was justified by his works. But he believed God and was imputed to him to righteousness. So two very distinct, different things that Abraham received. Just as we saw here in Romans chapter 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertains to the flesh hath found? Verse 1. Well, he found by faith imputed righteousness. But he found that he had to do works for God to justify him in his sight. So two things that were separate, which today when we're saved are the same. Today when we're saved by the gospel of salvation, guess what? We have imputed righteousness the very moment that we get saved. And we are justified. So we get both of these at the same time. When 
But back here, he had to get them in two completely different times. So Abraham was justified by works, and God imputed righteousness to him by faith. Two separate times. Let's go back to uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter 4. And verse 3, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. So here we have a quote from the Old Testament. Now, if you remember last time when we went through Romans chapter 3, we saw how many times over and over and over Paul is quoting the Old Testament. He's going to Psalms. He's going to Proverbs. He's going to Isaiah. Now, he's going to Genesis. Genesis 15, 6 is what he's quoting. So let's read Genesis 15, 6. And in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, we read, I'll back up to verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall I see me. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, what did he believe? You cannot read the Bible and think that salvation is the same through the whole thing. Because what Abraham believed in is not what we believe in today. God showed up to Abraham and said, Do you see the stars in heaven? You see the sands of the sea? He said, your sea will be like that. Do you believe me or not? He says, I believe you, Lord. And God imputed in him his righteousness. Is that how we're saved today? Are we saved by believing that God's going to bless us and make our seed on this earth like to the sands of the sea and the stars of the heaven? Heck no. <laughs> it's nothing to do with our seed salvation. But yet with Abraham, it's all about his seed. So it's completely different if you just study and look at it. So what we have here is Abraham believed the message that God message is not the same message for us today. God is looking at your heart, and what God wants is for you to believe him. And you know how outlandish it was what God told Abraham? If you go back to the Old Testament and you read that, God told Abraham, he showed up to Abraham when he was about 100 years old. We're about to find out in the book of Romans. And he said, Abraham, you don't have any children. And God says, I tell you what, Abraham, I'm going to give you as many children as there are stars in heaven and as the sands of the sea. Now, if you were 100 years old, would you believe that? Or would you go, 100 years old? And you're telling me I'm going to have a bunch of kids? <laughs> you're crazy. But Abraham didn't do that. He said, yes, Lord, if you said, I believe it. You know what Abraham's wife was? She was 90 years old. As a matter of fact, you read to the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord came, and she heard the angel of the Lord talking to Abraham, and Sarah was in there. And, and God says, now, Abraham, I told you, I'm going to give you the, a, a many seed, many children. And the Bible says that Sarah was in there, and she went, <coughs> and started laughing. And the angel of the Lord says, why did Sarah laugh? And Sarah goes, oh, I didn't laugh. She lied. She lied. She didn't believe it. But Abraham believed it, and guess what? It happened. They had Isaac, and she was 90 years old and gave birth to Isaac. Wow. So, yeah, that took some faith. But it was a different faith than the faith of today. We do not believe that we're going to have a child when we're 90 years old. That's not what God told us to believe. That's not the message. The message is trust the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Trust what he did for you for salvation. But yet we see this message in the type of that back there. How do you see that? That's why we read the Old Testament, because Jesus is there in type over and over and over again. And that's why it's so important. So as we continue looking at this message in the Old Testament, we will see Christ there plainly in the life of Abraham and Isaac. But we must remember that salvation is not the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. Go to Genesis chapter 22. We looked at what happened for God to impute his righteousness to Abraham. He believed. He believed something that was so far-fetched, many people today would, wouldn't believe it. They couldn't believe, I'm 100 years old, and my wife is 90, and I'm going to have a kid. I can't believe that. Well, God told him that, and he believed it. Now, when did he get justified? Well, he got justified by a work. What was the work that he did? Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. I'll begin reading there. It says, It came past after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, you're mine. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and laid the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place far off. Now, 
Do you realize what, what's going on here? God had come to Abraham and said, you're going to have children that are so many you'll never be able to count. And you're 100 years old. Then one day, after he actually had that son, Isaac, he got because he believed God. God comes to him and goes, now I want you to take that son, Isaac. I want you to go count. I want you to go to a certain mountain, and I'll tell you which one. And you know what's interesting? It's called Calvary. It's more Mount Moriah, which is Calvary. The same exact mountain in which God the Father offered up his son some two or three or four thousand years later. I think it was two thousand. So what does Isaac do? I mean, what does Abraham do? He doesn't go, no way, Lord. Heck no. This is my promise. See, you told me not to do that. No, he says, um, Okay, <laughs> and he saddles up his ass, and he grabs his son and his servant, and he goes. He obeys God. That's why he was justified, because he did what God told him to do. Now, I'm not going to argue with you. Some people say, well, that's sick. Why would God tell a man to do that to his son? Well, if you read the rest of it, you'll find out that God had no intention whatsoever that he would literally kill his son. God just wanted to know if he was willing to obey him. And as you read, I won't read the rest of the passage, that when he put his son Abraham down, Abraham put his son Isaac down. He had the knife and he was about to obey God. And God goes, okay, that's enough. I see that he loved me enough to do whatever I tell him to do. And so when he was about to kill his son, the angel grabbed it and said, okay, that's good. That's good. Now, while he was doing the work, there was some faith involved as well. This is amazing. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm getting my notes a little backwards here, but at least I'll get it all out there. This is what's so amazing. What's so amazing about the faith of Abraham. Go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17 through 19. Hebrews 11, 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. What was the promise? The promise of the seed. And it says here in verse 19, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called Accounting that God was able, verse 19, to raise him up even from the dead, for whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham believed that God would give him that son. Even though he was so old, that's not really when people have kids. And then God told him, now take that son and kill him. Take him up on Mount Moriah and stab through his heart till he's dead. But Abraham was still in point number one. But God said from that seed will come a mighty seed throughout the whole earth. So in his mind, Abraham was thinking, all right, I'm going to do this because God said to do it. But I know one thing. That is a promise who God cannot lie, cannot take away. So somehow that son is going to come back to life in order to fulfill promise number one. And so Abraham in his mind figured it out. He said, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to stab through the heart of that child. And then when I do, when that child is dead, he's going to raise from the dead and stand up and say, Good job, Dad. You did exactly what God told you to do. And so Abraham was fully purposed in his mind to obey God at any cost, believing by faith that God would raise his son from the dead. So that's a perfect type of Jesus Christ who rose from the dead. It's amazing. The same exact spot on the earth, Mount Moriah, which in those days was called Mount Calvary. So that was the faith of Abraham. Some faith he had. He had faith to believe that if his son was killed, he would rise again. Because he knew that God could not lie and God promised through that child the seed, the children would be more than the sands of the sea and the stars of the earth. Now, let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Now, see how different that is from salvation today? Nowhere in the Bible are we told to go kill our children. We should never do that. that. That has nothing to do with salvation. Jesus Christ died for us. Abraham, a type of God the Father, did sacrifice his son, believing that he would rise again, and he did. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 through 8. <clears throat> Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Well, that's where he got God's imputed righteousness, when he believed. But it was after that he was justified by works had to obey God to take that child up and sacrifice him. But even that showed that he was believing in God. And so it says here, verse 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. 
I don't know anybody that had more faith in this world and this life than Abraham. Because he believed that if he killed his child, doing you know what God told him to, that his child would raise again. When we trust in Jesus Christ, what do we trust in the death, the burial, and the resurrection? We believe that Jesus rose from the dead. It says here in verse 8, In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So the scripture, the Bible, foreseeing that this will be preached to the heathen. So this back here is a perfect type of Christ on the cross. It's a type of the gospel, the death, burial, and burial, resurrection. Because he was believing that if he dies, he's going to be risen again. So it's a type of this gospel. But it is not this gospel. It's a type of it. Nowhere in this does it say trust the blood of Jesus. So <clears throat> what we see is we see Abraham is a type of New Testament salvation. This whole thing of Abraham in the Old Testament, it's a type of New Testament salvation. But it's all about faith. But yet today it's not about works. So Paul gives this illustration to show you, look, how important is faith. And yet, he was justified by works. Well, guess what? We don't have to sacrifice anything. Today, Christ has been sacrificed to us. So for us today, it's only by faith. There are no works involved. And that's what we get to when we get back to chapter 4 of Romans. Romans chapter 4. Look at verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath bear up to glory, but not before God. See, he wasn't glorying in the work that he did. Abraham wasn't saying, yep, I almost killed my son, and saying how great it was that he killed him. It was all more about the faith. Verse 3, for what saith the scriptures, Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. So the imputed righteousness was by faith, even though he was justified by works. Now what he'll tell us here in chapter 4 and verse 4 and verse 5 and verse 6 and verse 7 and verse 8 is the contrast. Yes, there was some justification by works. Yes, it was faith and works here. But here, it's all by faith without works. And that's what many people don't understand today. They claim to be Christians, but they're trying to work their way to heaven. And you can't do it. It's not by works that we're saved. Verse 4 the very first word says it all. Now, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now, last time in chapter 3, we saw that so important word, now. In chapter 3, verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Paul is going through, and he's writing to these Jews, mostly. He's writing to Gentiles also, how to be saved, but he's starting this book out mostly to Jews. And he says, but now. So this whole chapter and the chapter preceding is, is a now and then set up. Now we're saved by this. Back then they were saved by that. So Paul is showing you the difference of a dispensation as he's writing the book of Romans. Now is how we're saved this. So that was back then. This was back before the law. In the time when a person was saved by grace. And yet they had to do some works for God to justify them. Be justified by works. Here, it's faith alone without works, as we shall see. So, verse 4. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. So, I just finished telling you about this back then, Paul says. But now, in the age of grace, in the time period in which we live, when people who get saved get part, become part of the body of Christ. But now... To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Are we in grace? Yes. So if you get justified by works, then guess what? It wasn't grace. You saved yourself. Grace is God saving you apart from yourself. So it says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. How did I word it here? In verse 4. If we work for salvation, then it's not a gift. It's not grace. But we are saved by faith and not works. And that's why salvation is by grace and not works. Now verse 5 is such a good verse. There still might be people watching this who still think, I've got to do something to get to heaven. Look at verse 5. But to him that worketh not, 
worketh not, but to him that does no works, it's not by works, but him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So that's now, verse 4, in the church period. Salvation now is not by works. It's by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So we are not saved by any works like the work that Abraham did. Don't try to kill your kids, please. We are not saved by the works of the law. We are saved only by not working and simply trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, after you're saved, yeah. If by your fruit you shall know them. After you're saved, you do lots of works for Jesus. You're supposed to. But that doesn't keep you safe. You're not saved by works, and you're not kept safe by works. You're saved by grace. So let me read verse 5 one more time. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So as Abraham's faith was counted for righteousness because he believed God, our faith is counted for righteousness when we trust Jesus Christ. What is the message that we're trusting? The message that we're trusting is that Jesus did all this for your sins in your place to justify you. If you will believe that that was for you and you're saved by trusting what Jesus did, then you receive eternal life that very moment. And you're saved by faith. Um, verse 6 and 7, I'll read together. He says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So now he's quoting again the Old Testament. And he says in verse 7 and 8, and by the way, these are quotes from Psalms 32. He says, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Verse 8, blessed is the man to whom God, whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, verse 7 is from Psalms 32, 1, and verse 8 is from Psalms 32, 2. And I'll just go ahead and read both of those. This is an Old Testament verse written by David. And God chose David to be a type of Christ in the Old Testament. That's why it's so fun to read the Old Testament because there's so many different types of Jesus Christ. Isaac was a type of Jesus Christ back here who willingly, you know, I didn't read all the passage, but the passage said that he laid down on the, on the, the, the place for sacrifice. Isaac could have looked at his dad and said, what are you doing? And his dad said, well, I'm about to kill you. And say, like, ah, and run away. But Isaac believed too. Because Isaac said, well, dad, I trust you. And if you told me that God said this, that he would make me a seed on the whole, whole earth, and you think that if you kill me because God told you to, that I'll rise again. And he said, I'm game. I'll do what you say, daddy. But Isaac was a type of Christ. Jesus willingly laid down his life in the cross for our sins. Psalms 32, verse 1 and 2. David says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom, unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guide. So this is a blessedness that we get through faith. And we get it through trusting in Jesus Christ. And we're blessed. And notice how blessed we are. We're so more blessed than these people that were under the law. Because when you're saved, you know that you're saved. You know that God imputed his righteousness to you. You know that you're justified. You know that you're forgiven. And you don't have to worry about it because you know that you are. Under the law, you could never know that. If you think you can get saved by your works, then you're always trying to do good works because you're always hoping that you do good enough for God to accept you. And so you can never know if you're saved because you never know you did enough until you go to the judgment. And go ahead and find out. And sadly, most people will find out you can't do enough to earn God's salvation. If you did, then it would be, as it says here in verse 4, reckoned of debt, not of grace. And you go to the judgment, and God says, well, you're still in debt. you got to pay for your sins by going to hell. So why not come to salvation through Jesus Christ? Salvation through him is so great, and you're blessed. You're blessed. Um, well, I guess I'll talk about that in a second. Go to, let me read verse 7 and 8 again. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Through Christ we have forgiveness of sins. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 tells us, and we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 
It's all through Christ and his sacrifice. And it's all through his blood that we receive forgiveness today. That's the gospel. The blood atonement of Jesus Christ. And you're blessed if you're saved. Spiritually blessed. Because you have eternal life. Verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not compute sin. Verse 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So the question is, Paul begins to ask, is this only for Jews to be saved? Or also can Gentiles be saved this way as well? Well, guess what? Yeah, either one can be saved by trusting the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the blessedness of salvation is to Jew and Gentile alike now, as it says in verse 4, now. Now, in the age in which we live, this time period, we're under the ministry of Paul. Now, you can be blessed spiritually by being born again, by being saved, by trusting in Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 9. Come in this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. I like that word, then. I'm trying to explain how back here was back then. But Paul says over and over, but now. Let me show you another example of that. Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. Um, Romans 5 and 11. Paul says, and, now not all, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now salvation is through faith in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Back then, it was like this. Do you see how Paul is making the now and then analogy? Back then, God saved these certain people this way. And he mentioned David. The sure mercies of David. David was under this Old Testament law. So I guess I should have put him over here. I'll put it like that. David was under this Old Testament law. And even though he was under the law, God dealt with David in a way that he gave David grace. Under that Old Testament law, there was two things that if a person did, there was no sacrifice for, there was no forgiveness for. A person was supposed to be on the spot, stoned to death if he did these two things. And those are the two exact same things that David did. And yet God chose to save David anyway, even though David did not follow the law. What were those two things? Adultery and murder. And I hope you know the story. David saw Bathsheba and committed adultery with her. He should have been stoned. And then he said, what do I do? She's got a husband. And David killed Uriah the Hittite, her husband. So adultery and murder. David should have been stoned. Should have been killed for that. But yet, God saved David anyway. This is what the Bible calls the sure mercies of David. <clears throat> In Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 3. We read of the sure mercies of David. And also in Acts 13, 34. Isaiah 55, 3, it says, Incline your ear and come unto me. Here and your soul shall, soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Here's Jesus, or here's God, or Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, talking to people back here, telling them someday, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. And it will be just like the sure mercies of David. My grace will save you without works. Because, boy, if David were saved by his works, he should have been in hell. Because his works were so vile and so wicked, there was no forgiveness. And yet God had mercy on David. The other verse there is Acts 13, 34. You see, this is all in the Old Testament, but it was hidden. There are verses that say that the Old Testament prophets did not understand the mercy of Christ and how salvation would one day be by grace, what Jesus would do. And now that we have the Old New Testament, we can still look back at the Old Testament and pull out verses that apply to Jesus for us today, just like Paul is doing in Romans, quoting so many Old Testament verses, because those Old Testament verses point us to Jesus Christ. What Abraham did points us to Jesus, because Abraham believed God that he would get a seed, and he believed God that if he killed his seed, he would be raised, raised again in order for that seed to continue. And that's the type of the gospel, Christ dying. Why did he die? For a seed. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, we didn't get saved. We become in Christ, part of his seed. And the Bible calls us the body of Christ. And then we read later in the book of Romans when we get to it, that we are through Abraham. We are Abraham's seed. Those 
promises that God made to Abraham that go through Jesus and to us today who are saved. What did I say to read Isaiah or Acts 13 34? And it's concerning that he raised up him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said, On this wise, I will give you the sheer mercies of David. So here we see God saved David by grace, even though he sinned and did the two things under the law that were, there was no forgiveness for adultery and murder. Now back to Romans chapter 4 and verse 11 or verse 10. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in incir uncircumcision? No, in circumcision. Not in circumcision, but in... Uh, okay, let me read that over. I'll start on verse 9. Covet this blessed is then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So he's talking about Abraham, okay? He says, how was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. When this took place with Abraham, he had not been circumcised yet. God gave him this promise, and he believed it before he was circumcised. Later, he received, verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they may they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So he's going back to this guy, and he's telling us that of this guy, there's two seeds from Abraham. There's one seed that's the physical seed, and that's all the children of Israel. That's the physical seed of Abraham. But then he tells us that there's another seed over here, and that's the spiritual seed of all people who get saved by faith, by believing. They're the spiritual seed of Abraham. So God gives Abraham two distinct different seeds. Actually, there's another seed if you want. The seed of Ishmael, which is a really, really awful seed. We'll get into that. The circumcision in this Bible is called four different things. It's called a sign, a seal, a token, and a covenant. Um, the sign shows up in 1 Corinthians 1.22. I'm not going to read all of these. I'll just give you the verses. The seal, Ephesians 4.30. The token is Genesis 17.11. In the covenant, Genesis 17, verses 7 through 12. So that Old Testament circumcision was something important that God gave to Abraham that all his children had to keep. And under the law, all people had to be circumcised. What was it? It was to show them that the flesh profited nothing. It was to show them, put down the desires of the flesh and think upon the things of God. And that's what that law is all about. That law is all about doing right in your flesh. And it's all about flesh. It's all carnal things that you're supposed to do. And if you've seen my video on one of my past sermons about blessings versus grace, what you did got you physical blessings. Well, this seed, the seed of saved people, this spiritual seed, it's all about walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. So it's a spiritual seed that gives a spiritual promise and it gives us salvation. And as he was imputed righteousness, we receive that imputed righteousness by faith. All right, chapter 4 and verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. We who believe receive the imputed righteousness of Christ. And the father of circumcision, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Verse 13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but to the righteousness of faith. So Abraham was to be the heir of the world, not through the law, but through faith, because this seed over here brought to the whole world salvation. We're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Whew, there's so much in this chapter. Verse 15, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. The law worketh wrath. Wrath is anger. People that are under the law are very angry, hateful people because they want everybody to be like them. So these people here in Rome who accepted Jesus as their Messiah are these angry, angry 
people that just wanted to keep the law came over and started, oh, you horrible people, Jesus is nothing, come with us, follow the law. The law worketh wrath. But it says here, in verse 13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world is not to Abraham or to the seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 14, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. So if you can receive the Holy Spirit through the law, then what good is Jesus? We can't be saved. So there was a promise given to Abraham of a future coming seed. The promised seed, the Messiah, came through him. And he is the one that brought salvation. And then it says, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Now, verse 16. Therefore, okay, we saw the word now. Now, as opposed to then. Then you were saved by the law. In the flesh, doing the works of the law, you doing something. And you were Abraham's physical seed when you did that. Now... We are the spiritual seed of Abraham, saved by faith alone, without works. And then he says these, this word, therefore. All right? Therefore, seeing that, all that was back then and all that was this way. Therefore, this is how it is today, is what he says. And look at verse 16. Therefore, it is a faith. What? Salvation. Salvation is faith, that it might be by grace. To the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So therefore, it is of faith. Salvation is by grace through faith, without works. Without works, verse 5. We see that again in verse 28 of chapter 3. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So salvation today is not going back then and getting under this, something that was written to them back then. It is living in the here and now, in which we are, and trusting in the gospel of salvation that God gave to Paul, because now we're saved by grace through faith without works. And I'll write that up there real quick. Grace through faith without works. Yet many, many denominations today that claim to be Christian, they all want to think it's by works. Are they saved? They can't be. Because we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith alone. And faith in what? The blood atonement. That's what saved is faith in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Now look at this. Before whom? Him whom ye believe, even God, wicked of the dead, and call those things which be not as though they were. A father of many nations, well, that must include the Gentiles too. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. So he believed beyond all hope that I am about 100 years old. And God promised me a seed. My wife's 90. I'm going to trust God. Guess what? God gave him a seed. That's an amazing thing. A 90-year-old woman having a child. Verse 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. God performs what he promises. God cannot lie, we read in chapter 3. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. What was imputed to him? Uh, God's righteousness. Therefore, therefore why? Because he believed. Now, verse 23. Now, there's another now. I like when he says now. Now it was not written for his sake alone, it was imputed to him. But for, all, for us also, to whom shall be imputed, if... Now here we see the gospel in verse 24 and 25. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. What is the gospel? The gospel is Christ died for our sins. This is in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Was buried rose again. Now, the last one is according to the scriptures, and according to the scriptures, which is twice. Now watch this as I read verse 24 and 25. 
But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. All right, if he's risen again, then he must have been buried. So you got that right there included. So that right there, check and check. And then it says, who was delivered for our offenses. What does that mean? He died for our sins. So he was delivered. How was he delivered? Upon the cross to die. So you've got the gospel being presented here for our sins. And was raised again for our justification. So twice he mentions raised again. Verse 25, raised again for our justification. Verse 24, raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And it's for our justification. The last part is so important. For our what? Justification. That is what we get the moment we believe. So when we trust Christ through believing in the gospel, trusting his blood atonement, the very moment we believe, God imputes his righteousness to us, and we're justified. It's not like Abraham, who believed God and was counted in him to righteousness, but he didn't get justified until he did a work. That work has already been done for us through Jesus Christ. Christ offered himself up, the Son of God, in our place for our sins. So if we trust the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, trust the death, burial, and resurrection, we are saved. And it's not, not a works. The next time we'll go to chapter 5, where it reiterates the importance of the blood atonement, verse 9. And it also reiterates that it's a free gift. There are so many times in chapter 5 of Romans when it uses the term free gift, free gift, free gift, gift, free gift, gift. gift. Salvation is a gift today that we receive by faith. It's not a works because if it was a works, then guess what? They would be in debt and no more grace. So there is a difference between a gift and something you earn. You cannot earn salvation by your works. Now, I've got three minutes left. Let me continue here and go back real quick. Stop it. Finish. Because it's 11 o'clock, so go ahead and stop that. Move the light up real quick. Thank you. So I hope you all enjoyed that. There was three minutes left on this video, and it is amazing. Salvation is just a free gift to us, and this uh, Romans chapter 4 has got so much great information. And so I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, we'll see you upstairs in just a few minutes at 11.15. Uh, for praise and worship. So thank you very much.